Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Lighthouse. We're coming to you live. My name is Jay, and I'm really happy to introduce you to the second half of the YSI plenary. Wow, what a first half we've had. We've really had amazing input talks from all, all our speakers. You have been submitting questions into the questions graph. Yesterday, we had an amazing day in Social Wednesday. We had an award ceremony. We had why is that trivia with a poetry slam? We had story time with Robert Skidelsky. I think we are really in full swing to take on the second half. Now let's remember that all the things we're doing in the graph are for us to share and map out new economic questions. You should go in and take this opportunity to now explore all the questions that have been submitted by all our speakers so far and the questions that we have been adding as a community in each of our questions sessions. I invite you to now look at those questions, see which ones you like, favorite them and add them to your profile, and in the question sessions with your working groups, add questions you think are still missing. So that's a great achievement already for the first half of the YSI plenary. Now, as we start, the second half, we're back in the questions fair, and we have a full day of events lined up for you. Starting right now, after I speak, we're about to hear from Fulashari Sule in the Inequalities Constellation. That's happening right now after I conclude my introduction. Then later today, we have a very exciting thing to share with you, which is we have received a letter from Pope Francis with three questions he has for us as well as from George Soros, who has also provided us with three questions. So at 3.30 Central European time, that is 2.30 UTC, we will be announcing these questions to the community and adding them to the graph. Don't miss that. Right after that, at 4.30 UTC, which is 5.30 Central European time, we're gonna have an input talk by Jeff Mann, followed by a, an amazing uh, talk by Michael Sandel with a with, with the discussant of Rana Foroha at 6 p.m. That is 7, 6 p.m. UTC, that is 7 p.m. Central European time. And to conclude the evening, we have an amazing event, which is uh, a live Q&A with Daniel Ellsberg and Rob Johnson at 8 p.m. UTC, which is 9 p.m. Central European time. And for that, we invite you to watch the videos that have been posted in the YSI Facebook group INET YSI comments and the videos that you've been seeing in the stream from uh, over the evening and that you'll be able to see in the 45 minutes before this talk starts. Now, let's move into the constellation, the inequalities constellation to be exact. We have our speaker ready to go. And before we do so, let me just remind you how to participate. I invite you now to go to ysiplenary.org and go right into the constellation because we want you to think about questions that you would like our speaker to comment and think about um, and that we would like to add into our network graph of, of questions. How that exactly works, we'll explain in this short video. First, go to ysiplenary.org and click the night sky. This is the questions fair, where each star is a question, and each group of stars, or constellation, contains questions within a particular topic. You can find questions fair sessions in the schedule in the left sidebar and join them from there. Just enter the session and join the Zoom. As you listen to the speaker motivate their questions, Think about which questions you believe to be pertinent for YSI. While the speaker talks, suggest your questions to your peers by entering them into the panel. This is not a Q&A. The questions are suggestions for research in YSI, not a question for the speaker to answer. Take a look at all the questions that were suggested and like the ones that you think are best. The questions moderator will select the most liked questions and present them to the speaker for a comment. These questions will be added to the constellation where they can be further refined. Refine the questions by finding the best exact phrasing. Suggest a rephrasing yourself 
or like the rephrasings that you think are good. After the session is over, you can find the submitted questions in the constellations. As a plenary participant, you can mark your 10 favorite questions in the graph. Just click the star in the corner of the questions card and they will be added to your YSI profile. The most popular questions will make it into the final list. With that, we should be ready to go. Allow me to make a final check with everybody that's going to be on the call. Question moderator, Alexander, check. Herbert, session moderator, check. Falashadi, our speaker, check. See you in the constellation. We hold these truths to be self-evident and see-through. Everyone's invited to the party and they're equal. Equal opportunity for all the party people, regardless of their party or their perspectival people. Yo, but here's the thing though, if we're being really real, we don't seem to all be playing on the same shape playing field. Everybody's game involvement doesn't flow with the same feel. Everyone ain't dealt the same cards, don't just tell me that's the deal, tell me why. Please define this ideal concept called equality. Everyone is equal except that some are born with property. Everyone is equal but some can't afford to lobby the same government that's meant to hold us equal in our sovereignty. Inequality, in inequality Some got it awesome, some got some, some got poverty Did we want its opposite at all? Or speaking honestly, is all this inequality the crux of our economy? Hi everyone, welcome to the Inequalities Constellation uh, and to another session in our question fair. Uh, I'll be your question moderator and just to repeat very shortly uh, uh, as the talk goes, we want to suggest questions. We want uh, also to like these questions using the heart button that you see on the right hand side panel in order to find out which ones we like the most that can then be brought up for the current comment. Uh, after uh, uh, speakers commented, we will be back here and we will engage in rephrasing these questions in order to perfect them and finally pick our favorites. Thank you and back to the speaker and the session moderator. Hello, YSIRs. Welcome to the questions fair. My name is Herbert Mbaki. I'm coordinator of the YSI Africa Working Group and the moderator of this session. Our speaker for the session is Dr. Folashade Soule. <laughs> Folashade Soule is a senior research associate in international relations at the University of Oxford. Her area of research are across international relations and international political economy, and her research interests are in Africa's international relations, global governance, and more recently, the intersectional study of negotiation practices Agency and Bureaucratic Politics in Africa-China Studies. She has published in several journals, including Global Governance, Foro International, Afrique Contemporaine, and Cahier des Amériques Latines. She holds a PhD in International Relations from Sciences Po Paris and has held fellowships at the London School of Economics and Political Science and as an Oxford Princeton Global Leaders Fellow. She has taught at Sciences Po Paris, the University of Oxford, Université de Lille, and at the University of Cape Town, London School of Economics, and the Xi'an Jiangtong University of Oxford Summer School programs. As a policy-facing academic, she is an advisor to the Commission on Global Economic Transformation of the Institute of New Economic Thinking and has acted as an international strategic consultant for several international organizations and trained young diplomats and civil servants in Bamako, Mali in international relations. Finally, Folasha de Soule is an editorial board member of African Affairs, Oxford University Press, and serves on the board of the International Studies Association, 
Committee of Engagement with the Global South. Hello and welcome, Folashede. Hello, Herbert. Thank you for having me. We are re- we are very excited to have uh, to have you today. Uh, now I'm going to give you the floor for the next 25 minutes. Then I will be back to share with you the question of our young scholars watching us from the constellation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Herbert. So um, my presentation today will um, focus on a specific initiative that I've led uh, jointly with my colleague, Camilla Tulman, uh, we on um, COVID-19 in Africa. So we led this special interview series uh, for the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, hosted by INET. And so the series aims to specifically engage with um, African and Africa-based economists and senior policy advisors about their perspective on uh, economic transformation and how the COVID crisis reshapes the options and pathways for Africa's development. So um, why this initiative, why this series? Uh, We noticed very um, early in the crisis that most of, um, let's say, the interviews out there and how Africa was being covered by uh, general news outlets um, did not feature enough, um, you know, African economists. So we decided to use this platform to get more, let's say, grounded, but also more granular opinions on how, on yes, on how their respective governments, but also civil societies have, um, have been dealing with this crisis and how they've been involved. So what we found out very quickly is that most of our interviewees are involved um, as academics, but also as you know, policy advisors in the resilience and recovery plans that are set up by their countries' governments, uh, which gives the interviews a, gr- a great combination of academic and policy perspectives. Um, and although our target has been largely on African economists, uh, we have been recently also extending our outreach to African youth activists, and Herbert has been also uh, helping us as one of the interviewers for one of the, the for one of the the yeah for one of the interview series. But we've also extended it to businessmen and also heads of institutions. So people like um, Dr. Vera Songwe, you now executive secretary from UNECA, uh, but also uh, Mossadegh Bali, who is the head of Azalai Group Hotels uh, in West Africa. Um, so. I will structure my, uh, let's say, these perspectives. I will provide an analysis of all these, um, of all these contribution, and I will structure them around three main questions. The first one is, um, and it will, it's also about the importance of providing a more granular perspective, and it's about how the pandemic has been addressed differently by African governments. Um, so there are actually three dimensions, you know, that came out of the interviews, three dimensions to the impact of COVID-19. And, they, and there's quite a significant diversity across Africa, partly because of the responses, the type of responses to the pandemic, which varies significantly across countries. So first, in terms of the sanitary responses, um, there are countries like South Africa that have immediately intervened with lockdowns, right? And generally, these countries have enough uh, resources to provide a safety net type of interventions. But there are also other countries which have imposed lockdowns without adequate safety nets. So they've used the power of the state to enforce such lockdowns without necessarily you know, taking measures to really um, take care of the populations that can go out and make an income, especially in the informal sector. Um, as many of you know, a significant proportion of the African population depends on day-to-day income in order to survive. So even among those who have enforced lockdowns, there's a big difference about access to safety nets and you know the impact will uh, clearly be different too. 
And then there's a second category of countries that have decided to go on, let's say, to go light on social distancing, you know, countries like Ethiopia, Tanzania, Ghana, Burundi, but also Francophone countries like Senegal, Benin, uh, Cameroon, um, that have simply put certain health measures of personal hygiene and social distancing in place, uh, not meeting in large crowds, closing schools and universities to some extent. Um, many of these countries are also facing immediately elections. And so they can't afford to do much, you know, by shutting down their economies. Um, so a big part of this differentiation is the balance between lives and livelihoods. And that's something that came across very strongly in the interview that uh, was provided by um, Dr. Ben Ondulu, who's the former governor of the Central Bank of Tanzania and uh, who's also a lecturer at the University of, uh, a professor sorry, of economics at the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, so for those that avoided lockdowns altogether, um, there are also a few, you know, in very small countries, like uh, in, the example of Soweto, uh, Lesotho, but they might just continue with less disruption, disruption to the economy because they didn't close down, but there will probably be a cost in terms of lives. Um, an example is uh, Senegal. So we spoke to um, Professor Felwon Sa, who is uh, a member of the Commission on National, on the National Resilience and Recovery Commission, who uh, explained to us how the Senegalese government uh, took the decision. So for them, um, you know, Senegal chose to apply measures which made sense for the situation it faced then. So a strict lockdown would have shut down you know, the whole economy and had, had, would have had an impact, especially on uh, the 97% of businesses making up the informal sector. And a large majority of people in this sector make their living from a day-to-day -day trading and transaction. So it would have been hugely damaging to uh, the productive economy to shut this down. Um, and especially in a context where there were, there were relatively few cases. Uh, this decision, the decision taken was just to constrain non-essential activity. And there had been some large religious gatherings planned in early March, uh, which the government banned, for instance. Uh, but overall, the sectors that were the most affected have been tourism, transport, restaurants, cafe, and of course, the informal economy. And so in Senegal, uh, having taken spe specific measures, the government decided not to put the country into lockdown, but just to reduce activities to a minimum, but shut schools and university and manage the situation as it evolved. So in terms of economic measures, um, the difference in the economic impact between those that went through lockdowns and those that didn't uh, is also a, mother, a matter of what happens after the lockdown gets eased off, particularly if they don't have the capacity to test and contract trace. Um, the damage on um, economic activities in African countries um, is brought about by the immediate you know, global reaction to the pandemic, particularly closure of borders with impacts on trade flows, and tourism, as I said. Um, but also uh, examples include the collapse in demand for oil with a number of oil producing countries uh, in Africa hit by the collapse almost immediately. The, another impact, the third impact comes from the global recession, right? Following disruptions both at home and in trading partner countries. So some countries are struggling because they don't have the fiscal space right now to deal with the combination of these crises. Um, countries that have undertaken enough safety nets you know, uh, to keep SMEs and the informal sector going will probably start the process ahead of those that did nothing. And so there's a, a big in-between, right, between uh, you know, those who have the safety nets like South Africa, but also you know, countries like Guinea who don't provide enough safety nets to SMEs. Um, and uh, the, in, well, the interviews... Um, revealed was that there were several, you know, 
there were different types of measures that were taken for uh, some SMEs in some countries, like in Ivory Coast or in Togo, you know, in terms of um, alleviation of, of uh, electricity bills and uh, uh, examples like that. Um, but they are punctual over. So, um, and of course, the formal sector benefited more from these measures than the informal sector. Now, it's important to look at initiatives beyond the government, right? To look at local innovation. Um, one good thing that has emerged and that came out uh, from uh, interviews that we led with um, Professor Takiwa Manu from the University of Ghana and who's also uh, the Vice President of um, the National Planning Commission of Ghana uh, is that um, local industries have stepped up. For example, a factory that produces alcoholic beverages, not only for Ghana, but also Nigeria and some other West African markets started producing hand sanitizers uh, to meet shortages um, and also to meet growing demand. And other factories that produce clothing you know, for export started producing masks and PPEs. Uh, so opportunities were taken. Uh, and there has been a spate of innovation. You no know, students, lecturers, ordinary people have all been coming up with innovations. Um, in Ghana, but also um, in countries like Togo, you have what they call Veronica buckets. Right? It's, um, you convert a plastic bucket into a container with a tap in the front, you fill it with water, you put a, a, a basin underneath, a small table, you know, like just for hand washing. So people have been coming up with new types of these buckets and they are being used uh, at almost every entrance of uh, whether it's an institution or let's say a pharmacy uh, or so on. So that's... Uh, some of these buckets are also solar powered. They use sensors to dispense water and soap. Um, other people have come up with prototype ventilators. Uh, you know, in a country like Ghana, there were only about 200 ventilators. So this has brought some lecturers and students in technical universities and even some individuals to start producing more. Um, so there's been no lack of ingenuity and innovation, but the question is how do we nurture this spirit of innovation, right? And turn attention to different sectors of uh, the economy. Um, how do we scale up and lessen dependence on external uh, countries? Another important element to mention is uh, youth initiatives. It was civil society uh, in, in the interview, uh, and Herbert, you can also, uh, this, uh, you can also, you, I think you remember this interview that we led with, um, uh, you know, on, on, on civil society uh, initiatives, uh, where our interviewee mentioned uh, that it was civil society who started creating messages in various languages in Nigeria, for instance. Um, it was civil society and individuals who started making comedy, creating content with comedic value for citizens to understand what coronavirus is about. Um, you know, a lot of messaging about how to keep your people, yourself safe, how to reduce your risk. Uh, and um, also many initiatives, you know, conversations for entrepreneurs and young people um, on how to repurpose their businesses, uh, how to make a good use of digital technology, um, but also the mental effects of being in lockdown, the restriction of movement and all those types of things. Uh, so, you know, th that's, that's important uh, to mention. And overall, you know, that's, that's what came out of uh, the interview that we led with uh, Dr. Vera Songwe is that the Africa's response has been quite strong to some extent, and credit should be given um, to three things. First, Africa had the benefit of coming last you know, to the crisis, and so got a little more time to prepare. Um, but also, you know, the other thing that helped was that over 42 countries closed their borders at the peak, or what is thought to be Africa peak. Uh, there's also a knowledge uh, in the last decade of how to combat health challenges after another, whether it's SARS, polio, cholera, Ebola, HIV. So there were some systems in place. Um, the communication wasn't perfect, but it was much better uh, when the system were in place. And that's the contrast to be made with North Africa, for instance. North Africa, where they haven't had any 
kind of big health crisis um, has not yet come out of the pandemic and there are still very high numbers there. They've had great difficulties in managing it and I know this continuous uh, lockdown. To some extent, Southern Africa also lacked the experience, well, except you know, for HIV, um, for instance, but um, the middle belt countries in Africa have faced uh, more of this crisis and do know more how to how to deal with that. Um, so also, I think what came out of uh, the, these interviews is also, and that's you know, around the second, uh, my sec the second um, element of my presentation is how this crisis can be a trigger for the promotion and implementation of new development models. Um, we have rarely heard so many people, you know, and I'm talking you know, in terms of intellectual circles in, uh, on the continent, many people in social and intellectual circles, circles express the desire for building a new and different world. Um, and so it's how do we build back better? How do we make use? Uh, do not let a, a crisis go to waste, right? As I said, uh, globally. Um, there are many... Uh, that also say never again shall we repeat this and what they are calling for is the need for diversification of the economic base but this policy debate on diversification economic transformation is already written in many policy papers for the last 50 to 60 years but little has taken place so I think uh, what what really came out the main messages is that it's time now to focus on using you know, of some uh, of using this moment to build back better, but also to build back greener, right? Uh, from a natural resource perspective, and one of our uh, one of of one of our commissioners, Dr. Fatima Denton from the Uni United Nations University Institute on National Resources uh, in Africa told us that African countries need to recognize being richly endowed with these resources. Uh, but, you know, there's a greater urgency to start um, a foresight planning, which what they talk about, what they talked about in a report by the, the university uh, on stranded asset reports, right? Um, it's important that government plan for diversified economy and exit from fossil fuels and a shift toward a more green transition. Um, and this should have happened yesterday, right? It's important to know that these countries cannot go back to drilling, extraction, trying to make as much money. It's important that these resources, uh, although they, there's now low demand, you know, that uh, many African countries who do not depend on these resources, but who might be tempted to take advantage of what they see as cheap oil, that they reconsider this. Um, so um, I think those were the main uh, elements that came out, you know, of all these uh, interviews and that are uh, really important to assess first how African countries have been dealing with the pandemic, but also how they can move forward, you know, out of the crisis um, and, and build on, uh, on all the lessons uh, that, are, uh, that were learned from, or that are still being learned from, uh, from the pandemic. So I think I'll, uh, I will maybe stop here for the moment and let you have it, um, tell me if, there are, if you have any questions that I can expand on. Um, and, and also if there are questions that you think are relevant from the YSIS. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. It, I mean, it's very interesting the finding about uh, the impact of COVID-19 in Africa and how each country react and how it affects the people from different parts of Africa in the north, in the south, east, west, and also like uh, how it create new out the crisis, create new economic opportunity. Thank you for your insightful uh, talk. Uh, now, I think, uh, now let's move to those question section. I think we uh, now we, there are some questions 
questions coming from the constellation that I'm going to ask you. Just a quick reminder, reminder to those watching us from the constellation that these questions are not to be answered directly, but reflected upon regarding the, their relevance for future research project. So let's see question one. Question one, uh, I'm gonna read it. Has cultural and state history made the, a difference on whether countries go with hard lockdown or a light approach to pandemic? Hello? Yes, do I need to uh, provide some comments on that? Yes, please, that's what, <laughs> yes, that's what our white tires are expecting from you because they suggest those questions from the constellation, they are watching us from there while we are okay. here. So I received this question here and we sure. want your, your, your comment to clarify if they can be subject to a research or can they be rephrases and in which okay, way? Okay, I see. Well, you know, I think um, there are some differences based maybe on, you know, different state um different state models or different uh, state policies, you know, but mostly uh, in terms of how, um, uh, let's say the economic uh, policies that were instead in the state of the economy as well. I, I would not bring, I would not necessarily bring in the cultural, you know, or the culturalist perspective. You need to be very careful when you include culture and what you do it for. So in terms of culture, uh, and I'm saying that also uh, as someone who has a background in international political economy, uh, in terms of culture, what would be interesting to see or how to bring in uh, this, um, this factor is to look at it uh, on how, let's say, how the different um, African societies are uh, reacting towards lockdown, right? How uh, it has been brought or not. You can see uh, that many riots started in several countries following lockdown because of the heavy uh, policy measures that were, uh, uh, you know, taking uh, in terms of, you know, trying to keep people at home. But as I said in, in, in my presentation, many of these of African populations that make the informal sector are living on a day-to-day -day basis. So they cannot, um, you know, they cannot use this as, uh, they, they cannot, well, they have to go out, right, and, and work. So that's something uh, very uh, important to take into account. It's not culturalist, but it's also, it's interlinked, you know, with economic factors uh, and not. So, yes. Mm, interesting. Okay, I have another one for you. Uh, let's see. How will African nations position themselves within the geopolitical tensions between the US, China, and the EU? EU? <laughs> uh, wow, well, uh, geopolitical tensions between the EU and China. So can you repeat that? Uh, okay. Okay. How will African nations position themselves within the geopolitical tensions between the US, China, and the EU? Hmm. Well, what, what geopolitical tensions are uh, you know, coming up is in terms of, let's say, the depth question. So I, um, I haven't... Uh, really talked about it uh, a lot in the presentation, but um, in terms of the depth question, it's, uh, you know, currently many African countries are facing, you know, a uh, uh, depth issue. So it's a mixed picture, you know, take the two giants, like Nigeria has a ratio of 15%, where South Africa has a ratio of 55%. So, um, Tensions arise because China is the first bilateral creditor. Uh, 
uh, and uh, many of this debt is commercial, this they made of commercial loans. Europe, um, you know, uh, in the Paris Club, uh, but also the US have, um, you know, are asking for more transparency right, in this regard, but also the China comes up with more, uh, you know, debt cancellation or, you know, some moratorium, which is, uh, something difficult because many of these uh, of these debts are commercial loans and China does not provide uh, uh, you know, uh, cancellation of the uh, loan. So where the geopolitical tensions arise is that uh, in terms of debt is how to renegotiate all this and there the tension starts you know uh, takes a lot, takes place mostly between the U the US and uh, China in this regard. Uh, but also to some extent uh, the EU. And I think that the interview that was provided by Dr. Vera Shongwe was really interesting in that regard in the need, you know, to uh, multilateralize more the question and also for it to become more transparent uh, overall. So, yes. Well, thank you. So oh, just I, I wanted just to add something like uh, it will happen that we receive some of some questions that are not related to your presentation. Okay, that's fine. What 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 is happening now is that um, we try to determine the the one uh, hundred question the most important that will constitute our mandate or the working groups. So that's why right now the. The members of the participants are just proposing questions that maybe they try, they want to start a research or they are mm. doing research on it. And so we just now what we expect from you is to see the relevance and comment how we can improve the question. Sure. And so, okay. but uh, I have another one here. Uh, this one, I think it. Link to your presentation. To what extent is cooperation between national leaders a possibility to alleviate the impact of COVID nineteen in the economy? Hmm. Uh, well, okay, please repeat that one again, because I. Okay. Uh, and I also want to remind you, we just need a comment, not an answer. Okay. okay. To what extent is cooperation between national leaders a possibility to alleviate the impact of COVID-19 in the economy? Hmm. Well, look, if, if you ask me to comment on this, you know, from a researcher perspective, I would say it's important to look first at what is already happening. There's been quite a, some, um, quite a lot of cooperation already happening, both at the sub-regional level, you know, uh, between African regional organizations, but also between African uh, uh, banks, you know, and, and development banks on some fiscal measures. Uh, and so that has been, there has been quite a surge of, uh, you know, multilateral cooperation on the continent. And I think that's something that uh, needs to be built on, you know, and you can see that well, it's possible to uh, refrain some sovereign, you know, uh, re uh, well, reflex, if I can put it that way, and, you know, come up with some uh, cooperation. So I think that's important. It's important to look at how these have taken place, uh, in which fora, you know, what were the limits to it, you know, and how this can be taken forward you know, from a policy perspective. So this one for, uh, do you think it fits more for master's thesis or PhD? Uh, this one can be a master, both a master's uh, and a PhD thesis, right? If it's a PhD thesis, it should you know focus on several case studies, you know, looking maybe at West Africa, looking at Southern Africa, you no, know, uh, but it's still possible to look at this. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I got another one right here. What is the role of research and the academia in responding to COVID-19 and its effect on African economies? Mm, well, uh, 
several things can be said. Uh, research, I think what uh, the interview that we led, uh, the, the series of interviews that we led show that, you know, and that's what came out, especially from Senegal, it's the, that the pandemic offered, uh, you know, uh, an example of how it's possible to collaborate between pol uh, political uh, and policy circles and academia. So um, that's something that usually doesn't really happen. Uh, these uh, these uh, researchers, well, they, they talk to one another, but to have direct impact on uh, responses to crisis, that's something quite new. So um, it, there is, you know, uh, and maybe if I answer this from a potential research perspective, it's uh, important to look at these various networks and to study them and to show, uh, well, and to analyze how has this been possible? Or, uh, or has this been effective? Um, and so maybe come up with a blueprint of how of how to collaborate better in the future, because that's uh, that really took place. And I think, well, it took place between more senior academics, of course. But I think that the COVID nineteen crisis offers a, uh, an opportunity to build, you know, more networks, more. Um, various, uh, you know, uh, networks, but also more working groups where both political and, uh, and, and you know, go let's say government and academics come together uh, to, to, well, to provide their knowledge and to provide uh, answers to the crisis. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Yeah. I have one way. Um, what can African economies do to benefit from not become burdened by their growing populations? Hmm. Well, the demographic challenge, right? Um, Research-wise. <laughs> uh, a little technical issue. I think we've lost Folosade. Hopefully she will be back in a few minutes or a few seconds. I'm not sure. But we are having a very interesting talk. And I was lucky to be part of her interview series. My first co cooperation with uh, Folasha this today. And it was very, uh, it was a good experience for, for me to work on such a project. And it's the, the most interesting in that project was what people on the ground are doing because hello uh, can you see me hey you're sorry back. yes sorry i had a technical issue with my uh yeah, i noticed i was okay. trying i was trying to be you for a few minutes but now okay. that you are back <laughs> so my question was uh before you had your uh, the technical issue was that what can african economies do to benefit from not become burdened by their growing population yes so that's uh, something that comes up uh, quite a lot in terms of um you know demographics it's important first to be uh, very careful about um, how you address the demographic issue. There's an issue, but sometimes uh, in when, depending on where you hear from it, you know, you, there tends to be quite some exaggeration, you know, about the whole Africa having you no know, demographic boom. Uh, when you look at the World Bank uh, data, it's, you might notice that some countries um, there are just, let's say, about four to five countries that have an issue in terms of um, no managing their demographics. N Niger is one of them. But overall, uh, most of African countries have uh, witnessed, uh, let's say, um, a slowdown in terms of fertility rates and, you know, birth rates. Uh, but uh, this said, it's still, there's still a demographic transition issue you now on how to provide enough um, jobs, right, to uh, the various, uh, well, to, to especially to the youth. So I think that there is where the issue lies in terms of, you know, uh, p coming up with uh, enough, let's say, policy measures to, uh, in order for 
all, let's say, for especially most of the youth, not to be tempted by uh, immigration and also and also talking about immigration. It's not, uh, as many of you know, um, em- migrations in Africa happen mostly internally within the continent, but still that creates an issue because most of the issues that they face in Europe, they also face it in other countries as well, you know, looking for jobs, being um, affected by xenophobia and so on. So yes, it's about managing uh, a just a demographic transition, especially in, in several African countries. Yeah, talking about uh, that uh, demographic issue, some, uh, uh, I mean, from your perspective, do you think like uh, the demography could be an issue in Africa? Well, you know, it's not the demographics that are necessarily an issue, especially in a context that, uh, in a context where you know birth and fertility rates are, um, are slowing down. It's how it's managed. Actually, it's about managing demographic transition. Uh, we have seen with this crisis that uh, one of the factors, the, the African, the fact that most of um, African populations are uh, young, you know, has made has also uh, been able to, um, well, maybe contain the virus or say, you know, made the um, death rates uh, lower. So in itself, it's an asset. Right. But if uh, and that's what came out of these um, the, the, the series as well, it's that uh, if, mo- if most of uh, African youth are not provided, you know, first with an adequate uh, training, right, especially in, in some sectors where there is a strong need to the Mali is an example, for instance, Mali is facing a double crisis now, a political crisis, but also COVID-19, just like uh, no, uh, other African countries, but uh, in this context, they um, m- many of uh, the Malian youth are, are facing, uh, you know, uh, problems related to joblessness, uh, but also the fact that the training that they've received is not in um, is not adequate, you no, know, for the job market. And by training, uh, adequate training, I mean STEMs. Uh, you know, um, everything related to, just to science, technology, but also just technical uh, technical jobs. So this, it, that's why I'm, you know, I'm talking in terms of policies, right? the need to come up with uh, adequate policies to provide these youth uh, better perspectives, a better future, and uh, that doesn't uh, entitle them to, to move uh well, to, to to cross the border, to put it that way. I mean, um, thank you, thank you very much for your talk, your presentation today. It was. I hope now the the our community, our members have now they they they, they have now more tools to to make the question and contribute to the 100 most important question that will constitute the mandate of our working group and our uh, our working groups, the 21 working groups from the YSI and our research agenda. Yeah. So thank you again, Hola Shade. And now I think it's the end of this part of this session but the session will continue in the constellation. This was just the first part. The second part is about to begin, but before that, back to the studio. Thank you. Welcome back to the studio. Thank you, Fulashare. Thank you, Herbert. That was a fascinating session. Thank you to all those in the constellation for suggesting your questions. We have a bunch of things to fill, still finish, a lot of questions still, still to be finalized. For that, I'll hand it back over to Sasha up in the Inequalities Constellation. Thanks, Jay. Uh, so we are finally back. And uh, this has been a really great talk. And although we started relatively slow on the questions, uh, as time went by, a lot of them emerged. 
which is great. And now um, our task is to try to perfect these questions, try to get these questions to sound the best that they can, to add additional layers of meaning and to see which ones we think are the best, most pertinent. And in order to do that, uh, we will now be able to add phrasings to the questions. If you look at uh, our questions, uh, here you will see under each of them uh, a suggest a rephrasing for this question button. And when you click this, you will be able to uh, basically provide a different formulation for the same question. It does not have to be the completely same question. The idea is that maybe you want to add something, change it in a certain way to some extent, uh, but still relate to the original formulation. Um, and uh, we are going to be doing that uh, for a couple of, uh, for, for let's say 20 minutes. Uh, and um, as we go, we can also add likes. You can now add likes to each of the formulations for the question and the uh, formulation that has most likes will take over as the dominant formulation for that question. Why is this important? It is important because when we get to making some of these questions favorites in the end of the session, it is going to be the, uh, uh, the phrasing, the formulation with the most likes that is going to be, uh, uh, that is going to be, uh, uh, that we'll be able to make our favorites. Okay, so uh, in order, now uh, this part of the session is really for us to, uh, come together as a community to talk to each other, to uh, uh, reflect upon this question, express our opinions, and really to be an open-ended conversation. Um, uh, I will try to moderate this conversation, but I really uh, ask you to join us, to put your videos if you can, and uh, raise your hand either through the, through the chat function or, or simply by, uh, by showing your hand, and I'll try to catch it so, so that I give you the floor. Uh, uh, what we can do in order to organize our discussion is we can go one by one through these questions. Uh, I'll first read you all the questions that we are gonna be discussing so you have them uh, on your mind and then uh, we will uh, focus on the first of them. So the first of them is the one that already has five likes. To what extent is cooperation between national leaders a possibility to alleviate the impacts of COVID-19 in the economy. Second, that we will discuss afterwards, how will African nations position themselves within the geopolitical tensions between US, China, and EU? And third, uh, what can African economies do to benefit from, not become burdened by their growing populations? And finally, uh, we, we have the question, has cultural and state history made a difference on whether countries go uh, with hard lockdown or a light approach to pandemic? So these are the questions that we are going to discuss. Now first, and we have already uh, started receiving uh, new uh, uh, phrasings, which is great. Uh, we are focusing on the question, to what extent is cooperation between national leaders a possibility to alleviate the impacts of COVID-19 in the economy? This has five likes. We already have two additional uh, formulations here. How can global collaboration and coordination alleviate the impact of threats to our economies, uh, such as pandemics, climate change impact, etc.? So we are broadening a little bit the, the scope of the question with this formulation. Then we have another version. How can pan-African cooperation be structured to alleviate the impact of COVID-19 pandemic? Okay, and this we can now discuss. So really, this is just for us. Uh, there is no one else. And uh, feel free to say whatever you think about these questions. Uh, it would be great to hear you. Uh, and it has been a great talk by Folashade and um, this is the part where we try to uh, translate all those great points into, into interesting questions for a community.
So some likes are moving towards the second uh, uh, phrasing here. And I see that some phrasings are also appealing for other questions, but we're gonna still stick to, to this one. So the one with global collaboration and coordination, the second formulation has almost taken over the first one. Yes, as Rebecca says, uh, um, if you have any comments, we really would appreciate you uh, telling us what you think uh, and, and uh, speaking to us now. You're not obliged, obviously, but um, uh, I guess it's much better and easier to think if we hear each other uh, than simply if we write. In any case, this formulation has taken over. So now the main dominant formulation for this question, which will be the one we are left with if nothing changes, is how can global collaboration and coordination alleviate the impact of threats to our economies, such as pandemics, climate change, uh, impact, etc. Brian has just texted me. Brian, do, may, do you maybe want to tell us something of, uh, about the questions that you have had or something in relation to this particular question? Uh, you can uh, un unmute yourself uh, if, if you wish. All right, so we are now going to move to the second question. Although we are quite uh, silent uh, in the, on the Zoom call, uh, we are quite active on the, on the phrasings, which is great. Oh, uh, Brian, do you want to talk to us? Uh, yes, uh, I, I, thank you, everyone. Uh, I have a different, uh, I've had a different experience with uh, looking at how cooperation and the different countries uh, react in terms of uh, pandemic relief. Uh, I'll use a case study of uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa, their relations. In so much as uh, Zimbabwe and South Africa are the largest trading partners amongst the two of them because uh, of proximity, uh, there's also and cooperation is most important in such a case where whatever happens in South Africa does affect Zimbabwe, those type of relations. At yet at the same time, at, 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 a, at a political and at a social level, once societies are somewhat different, it then also speaks to how the economics should also be treated as different. Uh, in terms of also the immediate, for instance, the immediate food needs that are wanted in Zimbabwe versus the immediate food needs that would be wanted in communities like South Africa, which is slightly more developed, um, become very different. Uh, and so the, the idea of uh, just a photocopy policy implementation across different regions uh, is very problematic in the sense that some people in Zimbabwe might not understand why imports of Coca-Cola, for instance, are coming into the country versus when you could bring in something like Mealy Meal or cooking oil, which is more, and yet at this other end, their economy is based on selling alcohol and soft drinks and all that. So, so uh, I feel sometimes also at an economic level, we then have to take an, a social appreciation as well. Also then taking into account uh, types of economies, uh, one which is more rural-based and agrarian-based versus one that has evolved into more tertiary and secondary industries. So that experience also in the lockdown and how it relates, where in some countries, uh, as was earlier said, it's literally hand to mouth on uh, subsistence economies day to day. For others, they wait for a week or a wage or which comes after the end of the month. And so in terms of even response, 
uh, at a national level, the ideas are going to be different and they impact very differently at the much lower level, the lower ranks in terms of the everyday you and me who are not part of the elites that are controlling right. the policies and the decisions. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Brian. That's, that's great. Uh, that's, that's an interesting contribution. Maybe it can be turned into another, uh, another uh, phrasing for this question. Uh, you can try to submit it uh, if, if that works for you. In any case, we are going to now also move a little bit towards the second question. Uh, we can still rephrase the first one. So if you, if you have an idea how we could approach it differently, uh, please go ahead and people can still like uh, a different formulation and, uh, and the, the dominant one can change. Uh, we will move now to the second question, uh, which is how will African nations position themselves uh, within the global tensions between US, China and the EU? This is the, the currently dominant uh, formulation, which has five likes. We have another two, though. One is, will African nations align with different geopolitical powers, thereby creating tension on the continent? This is yeah, bringing in uh, uh, additional elements to this questions, uh, question clearly. And uh, uh, finally, which geopolitical ambitions will African nations develop? Um, yes, this is again uh, a quite a significantly different uh, uh, formulation. Um, so uh, yes, here again, uh, if anyone wants to say anything, this would be the time and it would be really great to, to hear you. Um, I know there are some people here that have quite a lot of expertise on African uh, policy and uh, econ. And maybe if some of them would want to talk, it would be good. I'm not going to name names, but you know who you are. <laughs> um, hello, Sasha. I, I don't know if I'm an expert, but I guess I'll, I'll try to offer my opinion on this. In my view, you are. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so the question is, how will African nations position themselves within the geopolitical tensions between the US, China and the EU? Which I think is a very difficult question to answer um, and has quite a number of layers. Um, I think we already know that, at least from the, the South African perspective, um, there is the BRICS alignment um, with uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa. And so I think in some uh, sort of trade cooperative sense, there's already an alignment between South Africa and China um, in that mm -hmm. sense. It'll be quite interesting to see as tensions increase with, between the US and China, where South Africa will place themselves um, in that, in that uh, debate or discussion. Um, and so, yeah, so I think, I, I don't know if it's as straightforward um, to try to figure out exactly which way the government's gonna lean um, as we go forward. Um, I think in respect of the EU um, as well, I think fairly recently, let's in the past five to 10 years, we've seen South Africa um, sort of readjusting their bilateral agreements with uh, European countries. And so that's already been a sort of a signal towards uh, South Africa sort of um, making the decision to reprioritize its uh, international uh, trade agreements and, align, and sort of how they align themselves. And so I think that's also an interesting aspect that we need to see how is COVID going to affect that. Um, so as we see that, you know, European countries have been quite hardly hit by COVID, uh, African countries um, not so much. Um, the, South Africa, I think, has probably been the hardest hit of the African countries so far. But um, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see how uh, South Africa repositions itself in line uh, with, e with the European Union, um, with the impact that COVID has had on Europe as well. And so I also wonder if the European Union or European countries will start sort of uh, doing better <laughs> at, um, uh, at, uh, at cooperating with African countries on a more equal footing than what we've seen in the past. Um, so yeah, so I think this is definitely an open-ended question. Um, we, we don't have any clear answers to it. And I guess this is why uh, these questions are important because it sort of will lead to what will be good research to go forward 
um, for the group. In terms of rephrasing, um, I noticed that there's uh, other rephrasings of the question. Um, and I think it says, will African nations align with different geopolitical powers, thereby creating tension on the continent? Um, and I think that is, a, is an interesting question on its own, um, right? And so I think uh, that, that is probably not a rephrasing of this particular question, but can be a secondary question uh, to see Great. how, uh, yeah, to see how COVID will impact, you know, uh, South Africa and, and other African countries realigning uh, themselves with different nations and what tensions those realignments will cause. Um, and so I think those are two different questions which, uh, which need um, some observation. Right, so right. That's just me yeah. thinking out loud. For sure, for sure. Thank you. Uh, this, this is great. Uh, this is precisely what we need. Uh, I felt also uh, in, your, uh, in what you just said that uh, we should uh, focus on the differences among uh, African countries in the way that they position uh, within these uh, geopolitical tensions. So I submitted another formulation there with that type of uh, kind of direction. Um, so we have quite a number of uh, different uh, uh, phrasings for this question, which is really great because it means we are, this is inspiring people to think and try to, try to shed light on different dimensions of, of, of this issue. Um, and we can leave it at that for now. Uh, well, the, the formulation, I guess, uh, the formulation that is for now leading is how is it possible for African nations to position themselves within the geopolitical tensions between uh, US, China and the EU? Well, it was leading until a moment ago, at least. Uh, the, the, I guess the difference is that in this formulation, we are thinking about the possibilities of this positioning, while in the original formulation, we were kind of trying to predict it. Uh, so that's uh, for you to think and say what you like more. And uh, there we can turn to a third question that we got here, if no one wants to say something uh, on this one. Um, and the third one uh, that we want to, to talk about is what is the role of research and academia in responding to COVID-19 and, uh, and its effect on African economies? We have another formulation here, which is uh, what is the role of academia and research in responding to regional and global pandemics, which maybe is not uh, focused on Africa as much. Um, the first one is leading quite significantly. Um, if you have some ideas, some thoughts, this would be time for this question. I guess to me, uh, uh, Sasha, if I may, um, a comment. For sure, please. And this is a this is a, simply a plug for uh, another YSI project <laughs> uh, that I know that you uh, and oh, Louise yeah. and I are working on. Um, and I think uh, the comparative YSI comparative COVID nineteen project um, I think will be quite helpful in this regard when we're talking about the role of research and academia in responding to COVID nineteen and its effect on African economies. Um, and so I guess for those who, who don't know about the project, um, it's basically a, a worldwide project. So looking at different countries, specifically um, also looking at the African region. Um, and we have uh, 47 reports written by 27 rapporteurs from 10 different African countries, um, each responding to uh, the impact of COVID uh, on their particular country and looking at questions from everything from um, the democratic structures of the countries uh, to uh, what has happened in terms of uh, the business sector, uh, labor, um, as well as political um, or NGOs on the ground who yeah. may have had a different opinion uh, from how uh, the governments have handled the, the COVID-19 situation. And so I think that already, um, uh, the, the results will be published soon. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but I think that already was quite um, an insightful project for me to, to be part of because I think we could see how, um, like we said earlier, uh, each country is different, each African country is different, um, and how COVID has affected each country differently. Um, and I, so I think once we have a better understanding of the sort of the particularities of each country, 
we can better respond to what is the response for that specific country that is uh, context specific and relevant for that nation. Um, but then once we have a, a broader perspective of all of that, then we can start talking about what is the African response. Um, and I'm noticing in the Facebook uh, comments in the live stream, uh, we've had some uh, interesting reflections. Uh, and I see here, there's a comment by uh, Richie Rich, uh, who says, I think firstly, Africa should be united and then after take position, uh, we can't talk. <laughs> Um, and I think that's, uh, <laughs> that is... Uh, that's a kind of international problem. policy ask, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, and I think for me, it's starting at that sense of let's first figure out what is context specific, um, because I think history has shown uh, uh, a copy-paste um, method does not work across the board because of the particularities of each uh, African country. Um, that Africa is diverse across countries, but even within the countries, and I'm just thinking about South Africa, um, within South Africa on its own, we have 11 official languages and even more subgroups and cultures. And so um, there's a lot of diversity within the countries, which I think first needs to be taken into account. And once we have a clear picture of what's going on in the individual countries, then we can sort of have a comparative look at what's going on across the continent and what an appropriate response would be across the continent. Um, and so I think we've, we've already started uh, with uh, the YSI Comparative COVID-19 Project uh, to start talking about you know, what is the academic and research response. Um, and I think there'll be some very interesting com uh, conversations that come from that report, uh, from those reports. Uh, and I'm already thinking about things like food security, um, uh, looking at uh, security and surveillance issues as well. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many different topics we can, we can start talking about, but again, uh, research is necessary in all those areas. So that's, uh, that's my comment. Absolutely. Thanks for mentioning it. And uh, of course, uh, Africa has showed up big in, in the project and uh, you are definitely uh, the main responsible for that. Uh, of course, with our rapporteurs that have done a great job. Um, now, uh, we are going to uh, move to favoriting. So this is the final part of the session. If you haven't done this before, uh, it's very simple. On the left part of, of the right-hand side panel, you see a little star that you can uh, add to the question. You have 10 of these stars to spread throughout the whole plenary for the questions that uh, you prefer. And this will uh, help these questions become uh, one of the 100 questions that we got. Um, so we will uh, stop here and take a few minutes uh, to, uh, to choose our favorites. And uh, with that, then we will, we will close this session, which has been really great. And I think in terms of uh, rephrasings, we have been among the most productive sessions until now. Uh, so yes, think about the questions that we got and think about uh, whether some of them uh, uh, can be your favorites. Maybe some of the ones that Fulashade has submitted, some of the ones that we have just discussed. Um, yeah, I see some, some favorites coming up. So that's great. You can also uh, star uh, questions afterwards. This is not something that you need to do during the session. Uh, you, you can just start uh, now if, if something is really great, but then you can come back at a later point. Uh, so with that, we are going to we are going to close the session. Uh, uh, as far as I know, Thomas is ready to tell us something about our work here. And without further ado, we are going to uh, turn to him. If that's the case. Uh, you can start more than two, Timothy. Yes, you can start up to 10 questions. You can start only the, the most liked formulation, not different formulations. Rebecca, whenever we are ready with Thomas, uh, we are good here. We are starting our questions, but we can also uh, stop the, the, the session. Okay, we have a minute more, Rebecca says.
Okay, welcome back out into uh, the full questions graph. You can see the entire galaxy now. And up here, you'll be able to see all the questions that we just discussed. Thank you to Fulashade. Thank you to Herbert and Sasha. That was a great and interesting session. You can see that a lot of questions have just been added. Uh, and uh, for those of you that are following intensely every day, you might notice that the graph is looking slightly different. Some of the stars that were previously very, very big is a little bit smaller now. The reason for that is that we're now showing the size of the stars as the amount of favorites, that is the amount of people that have starred them. And if you haven't done so yet, and I know that a lot of you are sitting there watching the sessions, but haven't had time to come in and choose your favorite questions, well, now's the time to get in there and do that because that is how we will see which questions are the most popular. And I know uh, that you're here for the talks, but it takes only a few seconds and it's an important part of this process. So if you have five minutes, like if you have one minute, go in and mark your favorites. Okay, so now that we see all these new questions created over here in the inequalities uh, constellation, let's go into the inequalities constellation and see the state of that constellation now. Yeah, here we go. Uh, now you just have to go back out of this session and into the uh, inequalities constellation. Just to click there up, if you can click on leave this session. There we go. And then up in the right corner, when it says most reasons, you pick most favorited. And then now we can see, this is the same thing that you would do back on your computer. You can see the state uh, of the constellation and which questions are currently getting the most favorites. So in the inequalities constellations that we were just in, you'll see that the most favorite question at this point is, do free markets always lead to concentration of wealth? The second most favorite question is, how can we overcome the polarizing and concentrating tendency of the digital economy to address or alleviate inequality? This question is a bit interesting because it could go in the digital economy constellation, it could go in the inequalities constellation, but as the physics of this graph work, that means that these two constellations are going to be cl drawn closer to each other so that this question can place itself somewhere in between. But right now we're looking at it from the inequality constellation. The third question is how do we understand the relationship between power and wealth and might it be the key to alleviating inequality? Now, none of these questions are from the sessions we were just in, but if you thought those questions were more interesting, Make your way in and place your favorite. As you can see, well, there's many questions in the graph and a lot of them have received favorites, but the most favorited one has so far only received four. So if you make it in and you place a favorite, that could potentially change the order quite dramatically. You don't have to wait until Sunday. If you change your mind later, you can always come in and change your favorites. Okay, so uh, the next session that is coming up is with Jayati Gosh. It's not much more than 10 minutes away. After J.R.D. Goss, something super interesting is going to happen because we have received questions from the Vatican to put straight into the questions graph. We are super excited about this because the Pope is going to announce his questions. and that, So stay for that just after J.R.D. Goss. I'll see you guys in 10 minutes. <laughs>